This is going to be Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to look at some rules for a Bible believer. Number one, run to the Word rather than the world. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar chooses to run to the world for an answer. And we need to do the opposite. In Daniel 2, 1, it says, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. So Nebuchadnezzar had such a nightmare that he awoke out of his sleep from it. And he woke up in his probably king-sized bed, probably bigger than uh, Og, the king of Bashan's bed. Even though he wasn't that big, he just had everything he wanted. He was absolute dictator. Uh, the verse said his spirit was troubled from the dream. And I believe to a much lesser extent that God talks to people in their dreams sometimes today. He doesn't tell them the future in their dreams and things like that. But consider how maybe a lost person goes to bed at night and they dream about hell. And they wake up and they're convicted about their sin. And I remember being a lost person and having dreams about hell. Uh, why would the devil give me a dream about hell and convict me about going there? God in the Bible will reveal things to lost men in dreams. In Genesis 20 and verse 3, God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, Thou art but a dead man, because he took Abraham's wife. And in other countries that don't have as much light as America, God probably still does use dreams to convict lost people. But here Nebuchadnezzar broke up probably in a cold sweat from this dream, and he couldn't really remember the dream, so he saw after the wisdom of the world. Uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty says, Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 1 Corinthians 3.19 For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. The wisdom of this world is nothing compared to God's wisdom and the wisdom that he gives his people. Uh, now see how Nebuchadnezzar is going to run to the world to get his answers. Daniel 2 and verse 2 says, Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. If you are a Bible believer then you don't run to psychics and witches and doctors and psychiatrists or Dr. Phil for your answers. Bible believers go to God and what God said in his word. Nebuchadnezzar didn't seek a man of God here. In case you didn't know, magic and astrology and sorcery are all forbidden practices in the Bible. And this stuff has been repackaged as cute and innocent. And if you know me, then you know I hate Disney. But no matter how hard I try, I can't get away from Disney. This world is eat up with witchcraft and wizardry and magic. And you'll go, you'll go crazy trying to get away from it, trying to get people to quit buying it for your kids. I mean, you're going to have to get, you're going to be making people mad. They'll continue to buy it for your kid even though you tell them not to. Uh, family members. Uh, it's like they just want to go against what you say. I guess the devil gets in them or something, and they just keep on buying it over and over again, even though you said, no, I don't want her or him to to like Disney because of all the magic and the lesbianism now. It's just unreal, the stuff that's coming out of Disney. But it comes to a point where you just have to pray about it, and that's all you can do because we have to be in the world but we need to try our best to be to not be like the world. And if you go to Target and look at the book section, all you see is books about wizardry and books with the all-seeing eye symbolism. And I didn't even know if I was in a Target or in an occult bookstore the last time I was in there. They have spell books for kids. It's just a lot of bad things today being thrown in our kids' face. But notice in the verse that the king wants them to show them his dreams. He didn't just want the interpretation. He wants them to tell him the details of the dream. Possibly because he doesn't remember it, or he's, text, he's testing them to see if they really have any power. 
They claim to have access to something from another world, a spirit. But for the most part, people like that really don't have access to anything. And they are just after your money. Either that or they are desiring, desiring to look super spiritual. For the most part, they don't have access to anything from another world. Unless it is the power of Satan trying to deceive. But a King James Bible believer has access to the God of this world. You can go straight into the throne room and talk to God. You can open the book and get something from the God of gods. And when I was younger and lost as a 10, 11, or 12-year-old boy, I would prank call psychics pretending to be older and somehow they were so fake they didn't even know they were talking to a kid. And it says you have to be 18 or older to call. If they were a psychic, shouldn't they at least know my age? That stuff's usually just fake. And if they are telling you something that's real, it's because the devil told them. They don't have the power of God. They're of the devil. The wise men of this world don't have anything compared to God and God's men. But what Nebuchadnezzar did would be like the president today calling on Dr. Phil, TV evangelists like Paula White or Joyce Meyer, to get wisdom and advice from them. You're not going to get wisdom and advice from Paula White and Joyce Meyer. They'll probably lead you even further down the wrong road. They would give the wisdom of this world. Uh, Daniel 2, and uh, Daniel 2, 3, and 4 says, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show thee the interpretation. So you see, these guys want to know the dream before they give the interpretation. For the same reason a psychic or a necromancer wants to know details of your life first so that they can kind of guess what needs to be said or guess what you want to hear. And then Daniel 2, 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me, the dream. If you would not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. And Nebuchadnezzar is spoiled rotten. He's got everything he wants. He is going to get what he wants. And if he doesn't get what he wants, then he'll really just kill somebody. Have you ever heard somebody say, don't kill me over it? That's what Nebuchadnezzar will do if you just displease him. Uh, and that's where you get that saying. Nebuchadnezzar has absolute power to kill who he wants to kill. And this is because God's people have sinned and they have been put under Nebuchadnezzar's power as chastisement. And that is a picture of a Christian being turned over to Satan. Uh, Daniel 2.6 says, But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. So if they do show the dream, then they're going to get paid. And this reminds me how when a movie star or rock star or an athlete sells their self over to the devil for fame and fortune, they get rewards for letting the devil lead their life. So it can pay to serve the devil. But then you have to pay for serving the devil. Uh, Daniel 2, 7 and 8 says, They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation thereof. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time, because you th see the thing is gone from me. Okay, they're gaining the time. So they are stalling because they have no idea what to say. He says, I know of certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the dream. He wants to tell them, uh, he wants them to tell him the dream, not just the interpretation. And they don't really have any kind of power, so they are trying to buy time. And notice they can't do anything as they buy time. They are lost men who don't have the God of gods to call on for help. So if you run to the world rather than the world, then you're trying to get help from a bunch of people who don't even have a God to call on. Uh, Daniel 2.9 But if you want to make known unto me the dream 
There is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. Notice he said, ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. And that sums up the sermons, speeches, and talks, and books by a huge portion of so-called wise men. When a preacher gets up and corrects the King James Bible, he is giving you lying and corrupt words. And the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. And when a man goes against the King James Bible, he is a flat-out liar. Uh, they prepare lying and corrupt words in their outline. Uh, they go to the Strong's Concordance and set out to correct the King James and prepare an outline to do it. And there is no power in this. When the devil approached Eve, it was with lying and corrupt words. When he approached Jesus, he had prepared lying and corrupt words. Have you ever rehearsed a lie? That's what they did. It's because men are liars. Uh, Daniel one twenty says, The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked such things as any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. Now lo notice the ego of these men. They think that since they can't give the dream, that nobody can do it. And the world thinks real Bible preachers are stupid. These educated atheists and Bible correctors would laugh at a real King James Bible believer. They think a King James Bible believer doesn't have any answers. Just like these magicians and astrologers think that since they can't tell the dream, that no one can tell the dream. Uh, they say there, there has been no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. They think that since they can't uh, give the dream that Nebuchadnezzar is just asking something uh, nobody can do. But there are questions that can only be answered by the Bible. Then Daniel 2.11 says, And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Something different about these wicked men here is that unlike the majority of wicked men today, they know there is a spirit world. And they said, except the gods whose dwelling is with flesh, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Uh, they know there is something otherworldly like devils and angels. Unlike the wise men today, they think all that stuff's fantasy. They think the Bible's fantasy. They don't acknowledge the spirit world. And these magicians here, they know that there's a spirit world. Yet they can't get a hold of them for help. They are fakes. Daniel 2.12 says, For for this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the first rule for a Bible believer, run to the word rather than the world. And then number two, rest in truth, resist any doubt. The next thing, rest in truth, Resist any doubt. Notice how that even though Daniel is about to be killed along with the wise men of Babylon, he rests in the fact that God is going to give him something. And as a Bible believer, when the world around you is fake and you, you don't know what's a lie or what's a rumor, you can always go to the Bible and rest in truth. When the world around you is looking for answers, you have the truth. There is comfort in truth. When everything around me is a lie, a false flag, a conspiracy, deception, rumors, and slander, and gossip, I can still trust and rest in the truth as a Bible believer. So a Bible believer will rest in truth and resist any doubt. And there is no doubt in my mind that this King James Bible is 100% true, and Daniel knows that God is going to get him through it. He just has to get a hold of him. Daniel 2.12 says, For this cause was the... The king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And Proverbs 16, 14 says, The wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. And that is what is going to happen here. Daniel believes in the Lord. He fears God more than he does Nebuchadnezzar. And Proverbs nineteen twelve says, The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor 
is as dew upon the grass. If you make him mad, you die. If you please him, then you get recognition and rewards. It is opposite extremes. And God, who is the king of kings, operates in a similar way. If you believe the gospel, you get heaven. That's one extreme. If you reject it, then you get hell. That's the other extreme. His wrath has to be appeased by getting the blood applied to your soul. Jesus is our propitiation. If you reject Jesus, then you get hell for eternity. It's heaven or hell. And here with King Nebuchadnezzar, you either tell the interpretation or, or die. Uh, Daniel 2.13-16 through 16 says, And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. So you see how Daniel had confidence that he could get the interpretation. He isn't going to run to the Greek. He isn't going to run to the world. He is going to God. And when we want an answer, we go straight to the Bible. If you're a Bible believer, then you know you get the answer from comparing Scripture with Scripture. It isn't by our own opinion. Second Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this first, that the prophecy of the Scripture, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Genesis 40 and verse 8 says, Do not interpretations belong to God. So Daniel is buying time so he can show the king the interpretation. The other wise men also tried to buy time. The difference is that Daniel is going to use this time in prayer to get a hold of God. So he rests in truth and resists any doubt so that he can receive wisdom and revelations from God. If you look at Daniel 2.17, it says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the king, made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And notice that Daniel didn't try to do it in his own power. He got others involved in prayer. Daniel 2.18 says that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And that's what we need is mercy from God. And that is God getting us out of something bad that we deserve. That's His mercy. That is our mercy from God so that the thing doesn't uh, blow up in their face and that the king doesn't chop their head off and make their houses a dunghill. So they called on God for an answer to this secret, as the verse says. And Psalms forty four twenty one says, Shall not God search this out? For He knoweth the secrets of the heart. Daniel 2.19 says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in the night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. If there is ever a question you have about the book or a question you have about life, pray to God to reveal that secret to you. Uh, he may let it pop out at you in your daily Bible reading. He may have some preacher get up and preach it. But someone who stays in the Word and prayer will receive wisdom and revelations from God. Paul got revelations. John got revelations. Uh, Paul's the one who said, Let God be true, but every man a liar. He was a believer of God's word. John believed God's word. But this secret was revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. And I've heard Christians talk about God revealing things to them at night. And I've experienced this myself where I believed God was laying things on my heart that He wanted me to do when I was laying in bed at night or in, early in the morning when it's quiet. And every Christian needs a quiet time where God can talk to him. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And this tells me a Bible believer who rests in truth and resists any doubt will also recognize who he serves and realize he needs to get the glory. God needs to get the glory. Daniel 2.19 says, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Psalms 103, 1 through 3 says, A psalm of David, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Daniel knows who to give credit to. He knows who to give the glory and honor and praise to. And if you ever learn anything from the book, 
It is because God let you learn it. And that's why you need to recognize who you serve and realize God gets the glory. If you rest in truth and resist any doubt, you know who gives you the truth. If you learn anything from a preacher, God let you learn it. Uh, Daniel 2.20 says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. One day everyone is going to bow at the sound of His name. Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Every knee is going to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Daniel blesses the name of God. Daniel says, Wisdom and might are His. And in Job 36, 5, it says, Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. If you blaspheme and reject God, then you are doing those things to the most powerful and wisest being in existence. Daniel 2, 21, it says, And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. So he changeth the times and seasons. And Luke twenty one twenty four talks about the times of the Gentiles. Uh, God knows when the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, and Israel will be restored as a nation. God knew when each dispensation would end. He knows when the rapture will take place, and the world will go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, where the earth will face the worst time it's ever seen. And then the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled, and Israel shall be saved, and Jesus Christ will start the millennial reign. And he knows the very second that this will take place. He knows the times and seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings, because he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he'll set up kings in the millennium, kings that will help him, help him rule in righteousness. And Daniel 2.22 says, He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Every kind of sea creature that the smart guys haven't discovered yet can be seen by God from heaven. He knows what's in the deeps of the earth. He knows what's in the deeps above your head. Uh, he knows the deep questions and secrets. God knows the Bible better than anybody. And if you want to know something, just ask, ask the author if you have a question. If you're a Christian, then you have direct access to the author of your favorite book. Uh, Daniel 2.23 says, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now, now made known unto us the king's matter. Outside of God and the devil and the spirit world, Daniel has been the wisest person. Ezekiel 28.3 says the devil is wiser than Daniel. He doesn't say wiser than Solomon. Solomon had a different kind of wisdom. But something in connection is that both Daniel and Solomon prayed for wisdom. 1 Kings 4.29 says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. When you read about Daniel and you read about Solomon, you'll see a different kind of wisdom. Both very wise, but Daniel seems to be the wisest. That's why Ezekiel 28 says the devil is wiser than Daniel. I believe if Solomon was wiser than Daniel, it would have said wiser than Solomon. Uh, the only way to wise up is to get wisdom from God who is above your head. But when you get wisdom and understanding from the book... Recognize who you serve and realize he gets the glory. That way you don't get puffed up. 1 Corinthians 8 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if you don't want to get puffed up in your knowledge, then you have to help somebody else with it. Some people want to sit behind a desk and continue to soak up knowledge without giving any of it out. And that's how you get self righteous and crazy. And end up thinking you know everything. And end up thinking everybody else is wrong. And if you continue with that, in that, then sure, you'll, you'll know more than anybody. But you'll also think you're the only one who is right with God. And end up thinking you know more than God. And the next rule for a Bible believer is to reveal what you learn to rescue others. 
So rest in truth, resist any doubt. Recognize who you serve and realize he needs to get the glory. Reveal what you learn and rescue others with what you learn. Jude one twenty three says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. If you're saved, then God has revealed to you sin, hell, and a future judgment. And you need to cause others to fear the fire. And by doing this, you rescue their soul. Daniel got revelation from God in a night vision. And he rescues many souls by revealing what he learned. He didn't just sit back and say, God revealed this to me and I just want to feel important. So I'm just going to keep it all to myself. Uh, some men won't release a thought or illustration or sermon because they think someone will steal it and get the credit for it. So it won't help anybody. But if the message is any good, then it didn't come from you anyway. It came from God. It's God's message and not yours. God should get the credit and God should get the glory. Daniel 2.24 says, Therefore Daniel went in into Arioch, Arioch, or however you say that guy's name, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. So this pictures how ungodly men benefit from a godly man. Uh, America would have been destroyed a long time ago if it wasn't for some godly men. Lost people are getting to live here in America because there was some godly men. Uh, these wise men aren't going to die because one godly man got a hold of God and learned Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he is going to show the king the interpretations unlike the wise men. He isn't going to give a private interpretation because interpretations belong to God. And Daniel 2.25 says then, Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. And this is at the last minute. Daniel is coming up big in the clutch. Uh, Daniel 2, 26 and 27 says, The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able, able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. And this is because God's men always outdo the devil's men. God has men, the devil has men. Both have power, but God's men are hooked up to the one who is all-powerful. Daniel 2.28 says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Now notice that Daniel doesn't take credit for it. He gives God, God the glory. Uh, Daniel 2, 29 and 30 says, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for the sakes that they shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. He said, This secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. So he's saying, I didn't learn this because I'm smarter than anybody else. He didn't think he was some great genius. He knew how he knew what he knew. It's because he got hooked up with God, and he knows God needs to get the glory, and that he himself doesn't need to get the glory. So he's going to re reveal what he learns and rescue others. And next, he's going to remind others that prophecy is real proof of authority. That's a rule for a Bible believer. Run to the Word rather than the world. Rest in truth. Resist any doubt. And if you're a Bible believer, remind others that prophecy is real proof of authority. Every Bible believer, teacher, preacher, and Christian should get into prophecy. And one of the ways we know for sure the Bible is true is because of the prophecy. God revealed to Daniel this secret and gives him this prophecy of the latter days thousands of years ago. He gave him something that hasn't even happened yet today, thousands of years ago. And now Daniel is going to tell Nebuchadnezzar in detail 
the dream that he had. Daniel 3.21 or 2.31 says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. And this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Okay, so we have an image. It's bright and it's terrible, meaning terrifying. Daniel 2.32 this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. They say the weight of the image decreases from top to bottom. So it's top heavy and the gold weighs more than the silver, the silver more than the brass and so on. So this picture is the de-evolution of things. Things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. Evil men and seducers show acts worse and worse. We're not getting better and bringing in a kingdom ourselves. Things are getting worse. Jesus Christ is going to have to come back and he's going to have to bring in the kingdom himself. And these are all the, the kingdoms. Uh, the prophecy reveals four world kingdoms that will show up before the kingdom of the Antichrist. The head of gold would be Babylon. The silver is Media Persia. The brass is Greece. The iron is Rome. The feet, being a mixture of iron and clay, is a future kingdom made up of Rome. And this is the kingdom that the Lord Jesus Christ breaks in pieces when he brings in his kingdom. That future kingdom made up of Rome and maybe Islam is the, is the one Jesus Christ is going to break in pieces. Uh, Daniel 2.34 says, Thou sawest so that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were part that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. And now if you have read the Bible much, you know Jesus Christ is the stone. He is that stone. This, a stone was cut without hands that's referred to in Daniel 2.34. In 1 Peter 2.8, it says, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at, that, at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Acts 4.11 says, This is the stone. Referring to Jesus Christ. In Mark 12.10, He is the stone which the builders rejected. In Isaiah 28.16, He is a precious cornerstone. He is the stone cut without hands in Daniel 2.34, which will smite the image upon His feet that is of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Now, you know that He smites the feet at His second coming because He was smitten Himself at His first coming. When he came the first time, he was crucified. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So the stone smites the feet, which is iron and clay, in the future. Jesus Christ, the stone, was smitten by the legs of iron at his first coming. So we know that that was past... But that future, it, it, Jesus Christ is going to do the smiting. Daniel 2.35 says, Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Notice it says the iron, clay, brass, silver, and gold are broken to pieces together. And how is this possible? If all these kingdoms were at different times. This is because the kingdoms superseded each other. And the verse said they became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. It talks about it in past tense because God has already seen it. Imagine time on a DVD. All the time that's ever been from Adam and Eve till now. And on into the future. Put that on a DVD or timeline or chart. God can see it just like. It's on some kind of a chart. He knows what's on the what's at the end. He knows what the, at the beginning. He knows what's in the middle. He can look down on any of it and see it. So to God, it's kind of like it's already happened. The Bible says he will thresh the heathen in his anger. Habakkuk 3.12 says, Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Uh, Jesus Christ is going to break them to pieces and in the dust so much that the wind carries them away. As it says in Daniel 2.35, Jesus, the stone, is going to grind them to powder. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. 
That's Matthew 21, 44. Uh, Daniel 2, 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And this, the great mountain is God's kingdom coming in to take the place of those Gentile kingdoms. The Antichrist and false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire and Satan will be bound for a thousand years. And these verses prove a premillennial view. Jesus Christ has to come back before his kingdom can be set up. He has to take out the Antichrist kingdom. We don't bring it in through being peaceful. Jesus Christ has to come down in anger and take it over. Daniel 2, 36 and 37. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom power and strength and glory notice daniel calls nebuchadnezzar a king of kings a king of kings he knows the lord is the king of kings he also knows that nebuchadnezzar is only in power because let him be in power satan has power to put people in charge but satan has to get permission from god before he can put those people in charge daniel 238 says and wheresoever the children of men dwell the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath given hath he given to thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. That's what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, Thou art this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar is absolute dictator over everything, and notice it calls him the head of gold. The head of gold referred to back in verse thirty two, which is Babylon, so the metals and image don't just represent the kingdoms, but also the king of those kingdoms. Daniel 2.39 says, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. The kingdom that follows Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is inferior, and this is because he is absolute dictator. And the Persian government is a military dictatorship, Darius and Cyrus would be generals who forced laws through their armies. Uh, Daniel 2.39 says, And after thee shall arise a kingdom inferior to thee, and another th uh, third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So the king, this kingdom of brass, which is Greece, and under Alexander is a military monarchy. Alexander is a general and a king. Uh, his schedule was filled, was always filled up going around looking for new land to conquer, so someone else had to run it for him. He wasn't an absolute dictator like Nebuchadnezzar. J the Persian government was a military dictatorship. Darius and Cyrus were generals who forced laws through armies. And then Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, he was an absolute dictator. And the other kingdoms, they're inferior to Nebuchadnezzar's. Uh, Daniel 2.40 And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall break in pieces and bruise. Now this fourth kingdom, Rome, the iron legs, is a republican monarchy. Caesar was answerable to the Roman Senate. Uh, and... He's inferior to Nebuchadnezzar. He had to answer to someone else. Daniel 2, 41 and 42 says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now this kingdom of iron and clay is the Antichrist kingdom, and it, it is a socialist democracy. It is held together by the Antichrist personality and popularity and charisma. Uh, the clay is what Adam was made out of. If you've read verses like Job 4, 17 through 19, it says, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels shall be charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay? 
whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. He said, houses of, houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust. And then Job 10.9, it says, Remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again. Job 13.12, Your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. So who's made out of clay? Man is made out of clay. And Daniel 2.43 says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. Uh, the iron that mingles itself with the seed of men is a they. It is beings. And this kingdom that is on earth right before Christ comes back will be made up of devilish beings. It creates a race of superhuman beings, just like in Genesis 6-4. They mingle themselves with the seed of men. And this is considered a great fairy tale fantasy among most Christians because they refuse to accept something strange and their minds have been blinded through the sci fi genre in Hollywood. But a spirit can produce a human man in a similar way that God, a spirit being, produced a human man. Just like in Genesis 6, the sons of God, who were fallen angels in Genesis 6 4, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives. And this produced giants, mighty men on the earth. Daniel 2.44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And this is God's kingdom. The prophecy says that it shall stand forever. No one will knock Jesus Christ off the throne. No one will take over his kingdom. Uh, no devil out of hell can take it over. And when Satan gets off the chain, fire comes down from heaven and devours him and his army before they can even blink. Uh, Daniel 2.45 says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain made without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. You know it's certain and sure because it came from Almighty God. If you're a Bible believer, then you know the Bible is certain and sure. If you get the interpretation from the Bible, then you know you have the right interpretation. Jo uh, Joseph said in Genesis 40 and verse 8, Do not interpretations belong to God. Now, the last rule for a Bible believer is refuse worship and redirect back to the book. So run to the word rather than the world. Rest in truth. Resist any doubt. Um, and all the other ones I mentioned. But here, refuse worship. Redirect back to the book. A true Bible believer will always tell others the book is the final authority. And he himself is not the final authority. A Bible believer knows he doesn't know it all. And he knows he isn't God. And if you knew everything, then you would be God. So you don't know everything and you're not right on everything. Now Daniel messes up big time by letting Nebuchadnezzar bow down to him without telling him to worship God like the angel told John in the book of Revelation. But Daniel 2.46 says, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. This is complete worship. He falls on his face like men do to Jesus Christ. It says he worshipped Daniel. It says he offered an oblation and sweet odors. So there is an offering. So he's getting worship. He fell on his face. It says he worshipped Daniel, and it says he offered something to him. Daniel 2.47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Notice the king still doesn't consider the true God to be the God. He calls him a God of gods, a Lord of kings, a revealer of secrets. The truth is, God is the God of gods, the revealer of secrets, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. 
Daniel 2.48 says, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Same kind of thing happened with Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. And this pictures how sometimes God will take care of his children through lost authority. Maybe a lost supervisor at work takes care of a Christian man because he works better than all the lazy lost men. Uh, Daniel 2.49 says, Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So at least after accepting worship, he doesn't forget his friends. But if you're a real Bible believer, then you'll refuse worship, and you'll redirect people back to the book. A real Bible preacher, a real Bible teacher, a real Bible-believing Christian, when someone starts looking up to you and looks to you for answers, you'll always tell them, I'm not the final authority. The King James Bible is the final authority. I don't have all the answers. I'm not right on everything. Uh, God knows more than me. And you tell them that the King James Bible is where the answers are. But this has been Rules for a Bible Believer.